day, ladies and gentlemen. This is Red Ice Creations Radio. Welcome, new and regular listeners. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Henrik Palmgren, and we are coming to you from the west coast of Sweden. We are here on Thursdays and Sundays doing a radio on important and interesting subjects for your consideration. Uh, we highlight everything from conspiracy, secret societies, history, religion to new emerging technologies related to uh, mass control, geopolitics, the occult, space news, environmental issues and uh, much, much more. Our website is redicecreations.com. That's R-E-D-I-C-E creations.com. Take a look around, follow along in our daily updated news, and uh, don't forget to take advantage of our member section, where we have loads of material waiting for you to explore further. Today we are joined by authors Lynn Picknett and Clive Prince. They have uh, co-authored a number of books together. Uh, among them we can mention Turin Shroud, in whose image the Templar Revelation, the Stargate Conspiracy, War of the Windsors, the Sion Revelation, and they have a new book out now called The Mask of Christ, Behind the Lies and the Cover-Ups About the Man Believed to Be God. And uh, this is what we're going to begin to discuss on the program today. Uh, their website is picnetprince.com, picnetprince.com, where you can read more about the authors, find more information of, uh, on all their titles and the links to Amazon, where you can get copies of uh, all of their books. So it's a pleasure having both of them with us here today. Lynn Picknett, thank you very much for joining us today. Not at all, Henrik. Lovely to talk to you. Excellent. And we also have uh, Clive Prince with us. Great to have you here. Thank you for coming on. No, thank you. no it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. Excellent. And, uh, you know, just to begin and get things a little bit started here, for listeners that might not be familiar with uh, your writings and, and research, maybe one of you could just give us a little bit of background where uh, on some of the main areas that you cover in your work and how long you've been writing together? Well, we've, um, we met in 1989, and we've been writing, well, kind of pretty much since then, but our first commission was in 1993. So um, I think pr actually we're probably one of the longest surviving writing co-authorships. Um, I mean, you know, it t tends to happen that after a few years that people fall out, you know, have a row or something. But we've, we've stuck through it. Here we are still, still going at it. Um, and, um, yeah, we, we tend to um, concentrate on um, religious or historical mysteries. Um, and we've kind of, we like to think we've almost cornered the market in, in, in certain kind of revelations about Christianity. But we've also, we also did three books with um, another um, co-author who unfortunately died, um, Stephen Pryor, about, you mentioned War of the Windsors, that was one of them, mm -hmm. uh, largely about the Second World War. Um, so, but basically it's historical and religious mysteries that we concentrate on. Brilliant. And uh, I mean, let's talk a little bit about your new book then, The Masks, uh, the Masks of Christ, Behind the Lies and Cover-Ups about the Man Believed to Be God. Uh, Lena or Clive, to get an entry point into the subjects, uh, maybe if you can, give us an outline of what the new book uh, is about. Well, it, it really builds on um, what's probably our, our best-known book that we've done, which is a book called The Templar Revelation, which came out in 1997 um, and has, has been in print ever since, and it, you know, it, it's done very well for us. It was one of the books that um, uh, inspired Dan Brown in The Da Vinci Code. Um, we actually you know, get a name check in there, and, um, <clears throat> and because of that, um, uh, the... the the Master of Christ is actually a book that we were going to write, that we've actually wanted to write it for a long time, and we were going to write it just about the time that the Da Vinci Code came out, um, because we thought there was a need for a book that looked at uh, uh, the historical side of um, Jesus and what he was about, uh, which was partly covered in Temporal Revelation. So we were going to write this book back in, I think it was 2003. The Da Vinci Code came along, um, which actually made us then kind of change slightly, and we did another book about the Priory of Zion, the secret society that's, that's featured in the Da Vinci Code. Um, but the, 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 the good thing about delaying Masks of Christ was that by the time we came back to write it, there was a lot more interest because of the Da Vinci Code. There was a lot more interest in a lot of the questions to do with the origins of Christianity and who was Jesus, what was, what was he really like as, as a person, um, how did what he say get uh, changed, distorted, edited um, by the early church? Um, all things that um, uh, not that many people were familiar with before the Da Vinci Code phenomenon came along and, yeah. and 
told people that you know uh, you know the the New Testament, for example, in the form that we know it, is a product of the the fourth century, not of the first century. There was a whole process of uh, ed editing where texts were left out because they they uh, they, they clashed with the message that was in the the authorized gospels. Um, so, in a way, that laid a lot of the groundwork for us to then go back to the Mask of Christ to write that book, which came out um, uh, just two weeks ago. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's really our take on the historical Jesus and um, all the different theories that have been put forward over the years uh, to try and explain who he was, uh, what he was trying to do, and why what he did had such an impact on history. But you see, the thing is, Henrik, that we, um, we realized that, you know, uh, the kind of thing that we would be interested in if we were coming to this kind of subject for the first time, and there was a huge gap in the market because there, there wasn't one book one mainstream accessible sort of book mm. that ad addresses sort of all of the major theories about Jesus, you know, from the, the, the way out theories, you know, was he a magic mushroom, you know, um, <laughs> to, um, to the less, less way out theories, was he the son of God? Um, and um, basically, um, we decided that we were going to address that. Um, first of all, I mean, our first idea was simply to have a kind of overview of all the theories, but as we set out on what was to become an epic journey, really, um, we realized that, that there were several major points that were coming through, um, you know, clear and strong. And so that's what ended up as the major points of this book. So, I mean, I guess a lot of people will potentially see this book as an attack on, on, on Christianity. Do you think that that, uh, that will be so, Lynn? Um, yes, people will. I mean, it wasn't in, intended as an attack on Christianity, but inevitably it will be seen as such. Um, I mean, for example, we point out um, many things that are actually there in the New Testament, which people can read for themselves if they want, but in fact just go over their heads because it's not the kind of thing they want to see or note, notice. I mean, for example, you know, Jesus is thought of by Christians as being the epitome of the good son. You know, he, that he, he, he was somehow a, a, a marvellous son to his mother. Well, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. I mean, if anything, the evidence goes the other, the other direction. The New Testament tells um, a couple of stories of how she and his brothers um, would turn up when he was, you know, um, um, giving talk to the people and, and healing and so on. Um, and he would basically run away from her. And on one occasion, she she said that she wanted to, to get him and take him away and put have him put away because she thought he was insane. Hmm. That is not the general Christian attitude towards, um, you know, the, the, the Mary and the Jesus relationship. And yet we didn't make that up. That is in the New Testament. Hmm. I think one of the things that, that we, we learned and one of the reasons why I wanted to do the book, because, um, I mean, if if it's seen as an attack on Christianity, it, it would be at the level of an attack on uh, Christian dogma, not necessarily what Jesus himself taught and did. Um, and sort of one of the messages of the book is really, um, how little Christian dogma is actually supported by the um, by the text that it's it's based on, i.e., the New Testament. Mm. You know, there are whole lots of things in that actually contradict um, what later evolved into the doctrines of the church. So, but we've we're not really gone for the doctrine; we're just going purely for the history and saying, you know, the the, the history, the, the the information that we have on purely historical grounds tells us these things about Jesus. Now, the fact that they then don't match up to, um, you know, the basic teachings and doctrines of the church um, is, you know, that's just a, a side effect, a consequence of that. But, you know, we're not setting out to disprove those dogmas. But no, but, I mean, we're not setting out to disprove them, but nevertheless, that is what a lot of people will, will you know, home in on. Um, mm. And, um, you know, it was a bit of an eye-opener to us. I mean, you know, as, as we said, we, we didn't intend to do that. We didn't go for that. But, it, you know, this, this stuff just emerged from research. And, as I say, you know, it's actually most, quite a lot of it is there in the New Testament. It's just that people, they, they, they're kind of, you know, they haven't got the eyes to see. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, many people are looking into the fact that he might not have existed at all. But, I mean, you have done some assessment of the historical historical evidence about Jesus Christ, uh, to, to this day, do you still find, you know, it, it uh, to be the case that he was a real man who actually lived and, and walked in the area that, that the Bible claims that he did? Uh, yes, yes, it, he, he certainly did. It seems to be an increasingly popular idea that you know, Jesus never, never existed. He was either a mythical character or a fictional character. Um, but the evidence is, is good enough that there was 
you know, indeed a, a real person of that name who did things in the area and at the time that he's supposed to have done them. That's not to say that he didn't become mythologised. I mean, all, all uh, major figures do, you know, even down to the present day. You know, Winston Churchill, people like that, they attract myths and um, and stories about them. And in Jesus' case, uh, because of historical circumstances of uh, that the early Christians found themselves in, they kind of had to rewrite his message um, uh, you know, to, to a fairly large degree. Um, so it's not to say everything that's, that's in the New Testament about him is true, mm. but there's certainly enough external evidence to show that he, show that he existed. But also, that just from a purely commonsensical point of view, there is no doubt historically that St. James of Jerusalem um, existed, and he was actually Jesus' brother. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, this, is, this was known at the time. So I don't understand why people, you know, it, if they say that Jesus doesn't exist, what are they saying about James, who was known to be a real figure and who people considered at the time to be Jesus' brother? You know, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, similarly, you know, St. Peter did, you know, was, was, a, was a person who existed, um, and he followed Jesus. What, do we mean to say he didn't follow anybody? You know, it doesn't, none, none of it makes any sense. Hmm. Interesting. And what are some of the, the, the lies and cover-ups uh, about Jesus and, and who, who are uh, primarily responsible, do you think, for those, uh, the, the lies and the cover-ups? Uh, well, the people responsible were the, 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 the early Christians and certainly the, the very um, earliest form of, of the church. And there are many things they actually had to change for very good reasons at the time. Um, because of uh, you know historical circumstances to try and um, uh, keep themselves in with the Roman Empire, you know one of the sort of classic things is um, uh, the, the, the shifting of the blame for Jesus' crucifixion away from the Roman authorities in Jerusalem onto the Jewish leaders um, in Jerusalem. Now the reason that the uh, it's very clear from the evidence, even in the Gospels themselves, that it was actually the Roman authorities that were responsible for convicting and executing Jesus on basically political crimes, crimes of subversion. Now, when the Christian religion began to make headway in the Roman Empire, um, it wasn't going to make itself very popular um, by saying, you know, we are followers of this man that the Romans judged to be subversive and, and had killed as a result. So they changed the story to shift the blame onto the Jewish leaders, who were certainly partly involved in Jesus' trial, but you know they, they, they weren't the ones that actually had him executed. Um, so, you know, so that's one kind of very fundamental rewriting, um, purely for self-preservation of the first or second generation of Christians living in the Roman Empire and trying to keep, have an easy life for themselves. But, of course, one of the consequences of that has been 2,000 years of you know, Christian anti-Jewish feeling, which, you know, we, we don't need to spell out what, what that's led to. Um, not to say that the people at the time when they rewrote those parts knew that's where it was going to end up, but, you know, that, that's one of the consequences. Hmm. So it's things like that that have been covered up, lies have been told, Jesus' own words have been distorted. But to us, the, the, the big thing, um, you know, the, the major revelation of this book is really to do with Jesus' connection and relationship with John the Baptist. Right. It's something that, that builds on uh, some parts of the Temple of Revelation, but we've been able to go much, much further in this, in actually defining the relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist, and really establishing that John the Baptist was actually the more important of the two at the time. But this then had to be downplayed again by the first generation of Christians. Mm, uh, and why was that? Uh, the main reason is because there was... Um, in the very early period after the crucifixion, there were essentially two forms of this movement. One which revered Jesus as the this one. Movement. Not, one which revered not Jesus as either. the one. Not, not necessarily going to use the term Messiah because it's a bit unclear as to what um, uh, they, you know, they actually thought the, 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 this great person was. But there were people that regarded Jesus as the one, and there was a whole lot of followers that still regarded John the Baptist as the one. Um, and those two movements were actually in competition. And the problem that the Jesus Christians had um, was that the, the, the followers of Jesus had was that Jesus' own words had made it very clear that John was the more important one. But he 
Shakespeare basically defined himself as John's successor. That's the reason he was popular. That's the reason people followed him at all. Mm. Um, and because of that, um, <clears throat> because Jesus' own words praised John the Baptist so much, they had to rewrite those parts. They had to. They didn't actually uh, delete them, but they put kind of disclaimers, tacked them on the end. Um, now, and this the movement that actually upheld. John the Baptist as, let's say, the Christ, because it's just a convenient term, was actually still around sort of you know, four or five hundred years later. It wasn't sort of absorbed into the early church as people always assumed it was. And it, to some extent, it's still around today in some kind of um, um, you know, small uh, sect in, in the Middle East to this day. And actually, the, you know, the, um, the, the big moment in the New Testament where um, John the Baptist falls at Jesus' feet and says, Behold the Lamb of God, and he says he's not worthy to touch his sandals and so on, and then baptizes him. Well, um, you know, that can't have happened. That actually can't have happened. I mean, quite a few um, theologians um, agree now that, in fact, J that John and Jesus were rivals, perhaps mm. bitter rivals. Mm -hmm. and they, Jesus started off as one of John's disciples. Um, but basically, um, they went their, their separate ways. And then, of course, as we know, John was um, arrested and beheaded, and that was pretty much that, or so one is led to believe. But it doesn't work, again, on quite commonsensical grounds, because as Clive said, the John the Baptist sect went on after his death, went on for hundreds of years, and perhaps continuously to this day. So um, John can't possibly have fallen down at Jesus' feet and said, Behold the one, can he? Because if he'd done that, surely he would have turned around his disciples and said, Don't follow me, follow him. It's all over, you know, hmm. follow him. Hmm. But they continued. So he can't possibly have done it. Hmm. Interesting. And, um, you know, to me it feels that there are some branches, maybe not within Christianity, but more of the esoteric branch of, of, of um, you know, Protestantism, we can talk about Freemasonry, for example, that, that actually venerate uh, John the Baptist, it seems to be more than Jesus. Uh, do you, any of you think that that is, a, is a kind of a, you know, an idea that they are more up to speed of what you are talking about here? Is that possible? Uh, it's certainly possible. They retain memories of this, what we call the, the Johannite um, heresy or tradition, the, the one that upholds uh, John the Baptist as the true Christ. Um, it's something we dealt with more in the Temple of Revelation, which kind of looked more at the European esoteric and underground history and worked back to the origins of Christianity from there, whereas the Masks of Christ, we really kind of stay in the first century and, and, and you know, look at all the sources to do with that. We don't take the story on about how these traditions um, uh, developed. But certainly we did find, um, as you say, in Freemasonry, has a very high end veneration for John the Baptist. Now, the thing is, if you try to, uh, whether the, the, the top levels of Freemasonry know why that is, is another question. Because if you actually go into it and talk to Freemasons and look at the Masonic literature, they spend as much time debating this question of why they have a thing about John the Baptist as anybody else. It mm. seems that they've forgotten. All they know is that at its origin, um, John the Baptist was very important to them. Mm. So there may be higher ranks that still actually retain that, but as far as we can make out, they actually have forgotten themselves why there was. Um, this probably links to the, the Templars. Templars also had uh, a great veneration for John the Baptist for reasons that historians have never really been able to explain. Yeah, I mean, one of um, our first major talks about our book, The Templar Revelation, in which we we first exposed the Johannite um, um, heresy, uh, we gave a talk um, out, just outside Edinburgh to um, basically a bunch of modern Templars, and we were a bit worried. We were thinking, well, you know, obviously they know more than we do, and this might be a bit tricky. Hmm. But they didn't. In fact, quite the reverse. And afterwards, when we were having a drink with them, they were saying, well, it's, it's just brilliant to, to hear your research because, you know, there's this big gap in our knowledge. <laughs> really? Hmm? That's interesting. And, I mean, one of the accusations, I guess, of the Templars were that they were, you know, venerating this, this, this head that some people actually have, have uh, called a Baphomet. Isn't that right? Oh, that's right. And um, some of the Templars, under um, you know, questioning by the Inquisition, actually said that this Baphomet was the head of John the Baptist. Um, other Templars did give other identities, that it was the, the head of the first Grand Master of the Order and things like this. But certainly some of them said it was the head of John the Baptist. Um, and there is um, um, you know, a linguistic 
uh, link between the word Baphomet and Baptist. They both come from a, a similar a similar root. So, um, you know, that that was another very strong clue for us in the, the earliest days of our research that we, we kept, what happened, we kept coming across when we, when we were searching various Masonic orders, various secret societies, ones that claimed to be descended from the Knights Templar and things like this. The common thing we kept finding was that they had this extreme veneration for John the Baptist, and even they couldn't explain why. Then that's what led us to then go back to uh, the first century to, to look again at what we know about John the Baptist, to look at his relationship with Jesus. And that's what lifted the lid on, um, you know, there are reasons to venerate him when you understand that in, rival, in rivalry to the very first generation of Christians, and the first two or three generations of Christians, uh, they were in rivalry with other sects that upheld, that basically had exactly the same teaching, the same ideas, except they said that John the Baptist was the one. Mm-hmm. And once you, knew, once you know that um, group existed, then um, you know, everything begins to change. Um, everything you think about Jesus begins to change. Everything you think about where did these underground traditions come from, uh, you know, everything starts to fall into place. And what we've done now with the new book is with another 10 or more years of research uh, to revisit that question and go into it in a, in a lot more detail and a lot more sort of purely historical um, uh, angle. Um, but also to look again at many other things to do with Jesus. It's not purely about his relationship with John the Baptist. That's the most important thing that's been suppressed literally from day one and has and, and, and continues to be to this day. The, the Vatican still takes measures to try and stop people um, researching and finding out about this John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. Can I just can I just add um, that there's a couple of um, things about the whole John the Baptist setup which is um, fascinating, and again largely a question of, of reading what's there and, and common sense. Um, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and there's no, I mean, why, sh- why should we doubt that, that he was? Um, um, I mean, thousands of people were. Why shouldn't he be, you know? Um, but it actually wasn't what people think it was, you know, a, a, a sort of setting an example to people that, you know, they have to uh, repent of their sins and, and be reborn. I mean, yes, there might have been an element of that. But basically, when you were baptized by John the Baptist, you were being baptized into his cult. You were right. becoming a Johannite. Um, so that's what Jesus was doing. Hmm. Um, and actually, I should point out that in the in the holy books of the Mandians, who are the, a Middle Eastern tribe who still exist to this day, who actually are Johannite and uphold John the Baptist, not as a god or the god incarnate, but but as you know their their greatest prophet. Um, their holy books give a very very different um, picture of Jesus' baptism by John. Um, they describe how Jesus went to John and begged him to baptize him. And John turned him away at first and said, he's not worthy, you're not worthy. Quite quite the opposite to the story in the New mm. Testament, isn't it? Yeah. He said, no, you're not worthy. And, and Jesus begged and begged and begged, so finally John gave in and baptized him. Mm. Um, so it's um, very, very different. Interesting. And, and you mentioned the, the Mandians. Is there any connection to the, the, the Essenes or other kind of Gnostic sects here? Oh, well, the, the, the Mandians are the, the world's only surviving Gnostic um, sect or religion. Um, they're a group of, of people that actually live um, uh, today. Uh, the, their homeland is actually in the, the southern Iraq and, and slightly into Iran. Um, and they're a, they're a very small and very oppressed minority sect um, in Iraq that kind of sit between, they're certainly not Muslims, but they're not Christians either. So. Um, having a, a very bad time of it in the in Iraq at the moment, as you can imagine. Mm. Um, there are a lot of refugee communities now, sort of scattered throughout the world since the the first Gulf War, um, and they're an incredibly important uh, people um, because, for one thing, that they are, as I said, the the world's only surviving Gnostic religion. We know a lot about the Gnostic religions of, you know, the the early centuries. Um, uh, you know, the, the late centuries BC and the early centuries uh, of, the, of the current era. Um, but you know, we know about them as ancient sects, but they, they've all kind of died away. You know, they came through perhaps into uh, 
groups like the Cathars that were suppressed in the Middle Ages. Mm. But basically, all, all those Gnostic religions have either withered away or been suppressed, apart from the Mandians, and they're still around to this day. Um, so there are lots lot that we can learn from them basically about the origins of Gnosticism just on a purely historical uh, basis. Um, but the thing is, they, they can be traced back without any question to first century Palestine. Um, they certainly were around then. And the, you know, the, the big thing about them, certainly as far as we're concerned, is that one, they uphold John the Baptist as um, being the most important, one of their most important leaders in their history, not their founder, they say they go back a long time before that. Mm, yeah. But they have a very, very negative, to say the least, um, view of Jesus. Really? As you can understand, doesn't endear them to anyone that lives around them because you know, Islam places a great store on Jesus as a prophet. Um, Christians have never liked them for that reason. So, um, But, uh, you know, the incredibly important link. They certainly go back to, you know, the first century Palestine and the actual followers of John the Baptist that had to flee um, shortly after the crucifixion and settled sort of over the border. Hmm. Actually, the very interesting thing about John's whole um, um, John John's whole way, you know, the, the baptism of John, is that um, as I said, you know, it, it 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 was your entry into his cult, but also it empowered you. It took away your sins and it you know re made you reborn. But but you came out of the Jordan an empowered person um, because you, you didn't need a priest between you and God because this is a Gnostic understanding, a Gnostic uh, mysticism, if you like. Um, and what is interesting about this is for that time and place was that John the Baptist baptized women as well as men. Mm -hmm. Basically what he's mm. saying to them is, you know, you too can be empowered um, religiously and mystically and spiritually. Um, which, of course, very few people ever pick up on. And in fact, it took us a, a while to realise that this is what he was doing. This, mm. this is extraordinary for those for that time and place. Mm. Interesting. And uh, what about the? Or I don't know if you go into it in in this particular book, but the but the origins of baptism itself. I've heard that this is a much more older kind of you know pagan, if we if we should call it that or not, but uh, uh, rite that actually goes back to even back to Egypt. Any any ideas about that? Absolutely, that's another kind of important strand of the current book, which is looking into that. But there's a whole kind of problem of um, if you look at the story of Jesus, you can look at it as a very kind of Jewish um, story of a bloke claiming to be the the Jewish Messiah. Um, you can also look at it as a very kind of pagan story in that the the rites and rituals that Jesus is said to have begun or at least used. Uh, such as the right of the Eucharist, the you know the the, the, the body and 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 wine, you know, body and blood, right. a bread and wine thing, and baptism, have a very kind of pagan flavour. Now, most um, you know, researchers, most historians, have dealt with that um, contradiction by saying one of them must be wrong, one of them must be later distortion by later generations of Christians. He's either Jewish or he was pagan. He can't be both. Well, we've actually gone into it. And when you actually look at the, you know, get down to the really kind of core data, all of it's equally authentic. I mean, he does appear to have been both, quote, Jewish and, quote, pagan. Uh, the same as John the Baptist seems to have been. And what we found in, in the new material is that there is actually a way of reconciling this with uh, when you find out about certain... Um, um, sort of heretical sects within Judaism that were around at that time, that did an earlier phase of um, uh, the Israelite religion, yeah. um, in, in which they did have a lot more influence from Egypt in it. Um, and baptism is one. It's a very odd thing that we found in that most historians and New Testament scholars that look at that question of where John the Baptist got baptism from have to assume that he invented it because there isn't any precedent for it in Jewish tradition. And yet, at the same time, you know, the, the, the same culture that interpenetrated the Jewish world, you know, the Egyptian mysteries and the Greek mysteries, they used baptism in exactly the form that John the Baptist did. Right. Um, and yet, somehow there was this big mental block that, you know, they just can't imagine that John the Baptist could have had, could have got the idea even from, from 
pagan sect. And yet we know from other sources that um, that John the Baptist's headquarters, if you like, was was in Alexandria in Egypt. Um, so basically, he was, you know, um, had an Egyptian background, if you like, uh, and presumably a lot of his followers also. Um, so there was an e- Egyptian background, or perhaps an Egyptian flavour. And of course, um, baptism as as a, a, a public rite. Um, preceded by confession of sins in front of crowds of people, and then and then the the, the ceremony, ceremonious um, dunking in the water um, used to happen in the Nile, um, the temples of Isis and Osiris, and latest Serapis. Um, so in fact, you know, it was that was where John presumably got well directly the idea of baptism f- from, um, and it's just uh, remarkable that you know he. Um, as I, as I said before, you know, he empowered women, he baptized women. Presumably he got that from the rather egalitarian, spiritually egalitarian Isis and Osiris religion. Hmm. Interesting. And but what about the kind of uh, status, if you will, of, of, of John the Baptist? Either one, can you be, pick up on this if, you, if you'd like? I mean, I've heard, for instance, if we talk uh, about the research of, of Ralph Ellis, he, he traces this back to that many biblical pa- patriarchs were actually very powerful people, kings and even pharaohs in some instances. Is there any kind of background in regards to this about uh, John the Baptist? Um, one of the most interesting new discoveries of recent years, um, which took place of, um, around the year 2000, uh, was in Israel, not that far from Jerusalem, they actually discovered what they're now calling the cave of John the Baptist, um, which is... Um, a cave that was certainly used for baptismal rituals in the first century, and which is certainly associated with um, with John the Baptist. Um, it's very close to a place called Ain Karim, which was um, traditionally John the Baptist's birthplace. Um, and the archaeologists, the Israeli and American archaeologists that have looked at this this cave, have really come to the conclusion. Yes, this this was somewhere that John the Baptist did actually practice baptism. It's it, it's a cave with a, a big artif. It's an artificial cave with a big baptismal pool, certainly for for ritual use. Mm. Um, so that was kind of interesting that they discovered you know an actual location that was you know to do with John the Baptist and therefore probably with Jesus as well. Could have been where Jesus was baptized. You know. um, but the the uh, uh, surprise that it had for them was that when they actually dated material in the cave, uh, even the plaster on the wall that, that, that the cave was lined with, they found that that cave had actually been there, was had been built, and could only have been built for these baptismal rituals, six or seven hundred years before John the Baptist's time, which shows that John the Baptist wasn't um, uh, an initiator of a new form of baptismal uh, rite and movement. Mm-hmm. He was part of something, uh, a secret cult, because there's no record of a, a baptismal cult in Judaism up to his time. Um, but this cave had been used for baptismal rituals, say, for six or seven hundred years. Um, so it seemed to have been some kind of secret cult that had been around for many centuries, of which John the Baptist was part, and he was merely making it public for the first time. So it, it does go back to, um, you know, it taps into a, a much more ancient um, uh, tradition, a much more ancient form of the Israelite religion, which uh, I think, as many of your listeners will know, was you know, it, in its origins a much more pagan religion um, mm-hmm. than it became. You know, Judaism, as we know it, is a result of um, reforms that came about after the Babylonian captivity. Before then, you know, King Solomon worshipped goddesses alongside Yahweh, you know, the god of the Israelites. Right. Um, so th- we have this cult that goes back to the before those reforms that retain an early form of the Israelite religion that John the Baptist is certainly part of. And if John the Baptist is part of it, then Jesus, as his disciple to begin with, was also part of that. And of course the point to stress here is, is the secrecy of it, you know, the secret mysteries. I mean, perhaps, you know, um, John um, uh, you know, uh, performed your average everyday baptism, as it were, in the Jordan, as it's stated in the, in the New Testament, but um, there were sort of maybe higher grade rituals um, going on in this cave, because, as Clive said, nobody knew about it. Um, it's astonishing. Hmm. Interesting. And uh, 
Another uh, character, I guess, that you do touch upon in, in the new book is, is uh, Simon uh, Magus. Would, would either, either one, one of you uh, like to talk a little bit about him? Uh, yes, he again becomes one of the, the key things for us in uh, this question that we, we never quite answered when we did the Temple of Revelation, which is, you know, we have a, a kind of Jewish Jesus and a pagan Jesus. Um, we think somehow he's both. Um, so most historians would say he's one or the other, and most reject the pagan material and only retain the, the Jewish stuff. Um, but it's still, you know, we still never quite get a handle on how we could reconcile these two apparently irreconcilable um, uh, aspects to Jesus. Um, and then we began thinking about the very close parallels with Simon Magus, you know, the the first heretic, the this sort of great Gnostic rival to Christianity that the early church was so frightened of. And the reason I was so frightened of him was because he was so much like Jesus. Because, you know, the early church fathers would write uh, about Simon Magus, who had his own following. Simon Magus was a Samaritan, so he, he came out of the land of the Samaritans. He'd created this big following there, which the Acts of the Apostles tell us was um, basically taken over by the first um, of Jesus' apostles to go there. Um, so there's, a very, there's some very close relationship between what Simon Magus did and what Jesus' followers did. Um, and when we actually looked into Simon Magus, there's, uh, so the, the thing for us is that the early church fathers would write things saying, yeah, we know Simon Magus does all the things that Jesus is supposed to have done, and yes, he can do them, but he does it because he's in league with the devil. Jesus did mm. through the Holy Spirit. Mm. But they were really frightened of him because he was too much like Jesus. And when we looked into uh, Simon Magus from you know, early literature, early writings, we found some very surprising things. The first one is that, say, according to early, this early church writings, Simon Magus began as a disciple of John the Baptist. Now that seems like an incredible statement but it's there in the early Christian literature. Mm. So they regarded their great sort of, you know, almost anti-Christ figure, their, their first heretic, they actually believed he essentially had the same teacher as Jesus. So it makes, much, it makes a connection between them. And we do have some of Simon Magus' own writings. Not many, but some have survived in fragments recorded by early Christians in order to denounce them, but it's nevertheless still recorded his own words. And we found that Simon Magus was also, if you like, Jewish, because he, uh, the Samaritan religion is basically the same religion that came from the same stock as the Israelite religion, um, venerating the books of Moses and you know, the, the, the same things that the Jews did at the time. But he is both appealing to the laws of Moses and other very traditional Israelite things, but interpreting them in a very pagan way. Um, and that really seems to be because this original form of the Israelite religion, um, with its pagan elements, had survived in Samaria among the Samaritans right through until Jesus' day. Yeah, and it, sorry, sorry, I just have to say that the, the, uh, another jaw-dropping thing about Simon Magus um, is that there is evidence that he was actually um, John the Baptist official successor. Mm -hmm. Again, it's one of those peculiar things um, that in, in the New Testament it says that uh, when he was in jail John the Baptist um, had doubts about Jesus. He sent out this message and said you know, are you really the one who is to come or do we have to look for another? Um, and there's no mention anywhere that um, basically um, Jesus was his official successor. But there is some evidence that Simon Magus was. And again, it's, you know, question marks about um, what we've been taught about Jesus and Simon Magus and John the Baptist. Um, you know, John had his doubts about Jesus. Um, and also, of course, we're not told when John the Baptist was in, in jail that he um, said, right, I, you know, I know I'm going to my death and become a martyr for, you know, the Christian cause or, or Jesus' cause. I mean, he didn't, there was no suggestion of that. Mm. And interestingly, John the Baptist is not the first Christian martyr. St. Stephen is. There's big, big question marks over that whole relationship between those men. Hmm. Interesting. And, um, you know, you mentioned the, the cave of, of John the Baptist uh, recently discovered. And, and there has been a number of, uh, of uh, discoveries, if you will, within quotes, I guess. But 
I mean, for instance, the History Channel did a documentary on the Gospel of Judas a while back, and then we have the uh, even the Lost uh, Tomb of Jesus, the Discovery Channel documentary. I think J James Cameron was behind that. Um, ha have you guys been able to kind of um, uh, verify this in any way? Do you think it's interesting, worth looking, taking a second look at either of these uh, uh, two documentaries? Any any comments? Um, they're all worth looking at because you know they all add. Uh, in some way to you know, the, the total picture of what we know about Jesus, even if they turn out to be wrong. I think the Gospel of Judas um, probably doesn't go back to the first century. It was written um, you know, a, a little bit later, maybe 100, 200 years later. Um, but it, if, if it owes nothing to the historical Judas, then at least it tells us the kind of things that early Christians were grappling with about about Judas and his role. And, you know, the the thing I think must occur to everybody that sort of reads the New Testament and the story of Judas's betrayal, um, you know, actually, you know, whose side was he on? You know, was he doing the right thing? Because in Christian terms, in terms of Christian dogma, if he hadn't betrayed Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross, could, wouldn't have been resurrected. So he's actually kind of fulfilling parts of God's plan. If you look, you know, if you look at it in purely Christian terms, so. Um, and the Gospel of Judas, which we don't believe is authentic in the sense it's got anything to do with the historical Judas, um, it does show us the way that Christians were grappling with these kind of ideas. Um, the, the you know the whole issue of um, Jesus' grave and uh, uh, you know the possible you know the Jesus family tomb, which we go into in the book, um, we, we don't think it, it is anything to do with you know our Jesus. Uh, Jesus was a very common name. Most of the names of, you know, Joseph and Mary and people like that were very common names. Right. Um, so we don't think that that's um, uh, everything, everything that's claimed for that discovery doesn't really stand up. Hmm. But it still shows there's this huge interest, which, um, you know, maybe even 20 or 30 years ago, people wouldn't have had that when these new documents come up, when these new archaeological discoveries are made, um, you know, there's, a, there's a global interest in them, which kind of shows how people, how interested people are in the origins of Christianity, in the things that maybe show that the, 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 the story has always been told about how Christianity began and what it was supposed to have been, uh, things that call that into question. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's all... Anything that kind of gets people thinking and talking about it is good. Yeah, I mean, that, there seems to be this great mass hunger right across the globe for people to discover things about the truth about Christianity. Yeah. And also a great anger, which I think was stirred up in most people for the first time by the Da Vinci Code. Right. And, you know, a lot of people knock the book and say, you know, it was, it's not great literature or whatever, it never claimed to be. You know, But it actually has done the most amazing thing, and it's got millions, literally millions of people talking about this. Hmm. I, I agree, and that is very, is very interesting. Uh, any ideas why it is at this particular time that this is taking place? I mean, <laughs> we can even look at it this way, that we've gone, you know, what, 2,000 years almost, you know, soon since uh, uh, since Jesus' time, so to speak, and, and uh, uh, some people claim that we are at the, at the cusp of a, of, a, of a new age if we follow the, the, the zodiac, if you will, and, and at this point we're kind of unraveling the story of what has taken place in the past, uh, 2,000 years. Anyone got a comment on, on that? Uh, maybe we're moving into well, a new age. Um, don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. But um, I think what it really brings home is that for most of history, certainly Christian history, you were told what the story was, what you had to believe, not just in terms of believe in terms of faith, but believe in um, what happened historically. And people just accepted that. Um, but not as they did everything. And I think all these things today are just uh, a sign that people don't take things on trust anymore. They think about them for themselves, which is a good thing. Yeah. You know, it's not just a matter of the church says, oh, Jesus and his mother had this kind of relationship. Well, there's actually evidence that they didn't. Um, you know, Jesus may have been involved in a relationship with Mary Magdalene. Uh, the church will say, no, no way, you can't think that. Right. But you know, everyone gets gets to talk about it, and I think it's just a sign of the times that people are much more 
willing to question, challenge, and debate. And actually, I'm speaking for myself, Henrik. I mean, you know, I, I, as a child and as a teenager, I was a fanatical Christian. I mean, I really was. I was mm. totally in, in, into it. And then various things happened, and, and I lost that faith. And then the, after a, a long gap, I mean, coming to topics like this for myself and, and working with Clive, I mean, I got very, very angry. Um, you know, and I can't be the only one. You know, across across the world, for reasons we've just discussed, you know, people are also getting angry. People are also thinking, well, actually, we find out the truth for ourselves. And, and of course, the thing that, that actually fuels the debate, the more the, the established churches and the clergy and, and so on stand up and say, no, don't you listen to these people. You know, you know this is nonsense. The more they say that now, people just, you know, it, it, it's a bit like government saying there's nothing to worry about, which <laughs> everybody starts worrying right, right. And, and, you know so so when so when the church people say don't you listen to these people you know and, and the more they do it the more people listen mm. great yeah absolutely you know, that's what we're all uh, for here on on, uh, on this program and to just uh, ask the ask the questions and 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 dare to be uh, you know uh, question it all basically that that's the only way to to uh, get to the the bottom of this and and i guess also that there is you know, so much information on this particular subject out there at this point in time, uh, considering, uh, as you just mentioned, in the, the Da Vinci Code and so forth. So it, it's also a bit of a, you know, the, the market is, is almost flooded in a way. And, and one way to do it, of course, is to, to read uh, a whole lot of material and go through it all and then come to your own conclusion. But uh, uh, Lynn, would you agree that that uh, you know the the market on this is is kind of flooded at the moment, and that there's a lot of uh, maybe not disinformation, not conscious disinformation, but a lot of uh, you know misconceptions out there. Um, yes, I mean as, as I said, you know, we, ours I believe is the first book that, in one way or another, uh, looks at uh, all the main theories about Jesus. You know, this, it didn't exist. That he was the son of God. That he was a sacred mushroom. That he was you know the Messiah. That he was this. He was that. Um, because we, you know, as we said, we there was a gap in the market, and certainly I know that, you know, had I had I been like a young woman now, and I'm very very far off being a young woman now, but had had I been, um, you know, and I, I wanted to know the truth, I would have. This, this isn't just a you know a little commercial for us, but I would have loved a book like this that actually set out the various theories, and then of course I could go and find the, the individual books that back up those theories and read them for myself. So this is a good starting point, I think. Um, but yes, I mean, there's a huge amount of, of, of literature and a huge number of cults out there trying to sell one particular idea and, you know, and, and some dangerous, some not. Um, but I think, you know, it ever was really. And, I, but, and it's just that now there's so much coming at us um, and so much potential for finding sort of com com completely conflicting ideas. But I think that's part of the excitement. You know, it's, it's a, I think the important thing is that people's minds are open enough to go and search. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and I think that's a good place to uh, to run things up here for our first segment. I do want to spend the last few minutes here, though, to uh, talk about your uh, website uh, and, and also how people that are interested in, in getting a copy of your book, how they would go about doing that. Uh, well, our website, as you say, it, it, it's picnetprints.com. That's P-I-C-K-N-E-T-T. P R I N C E dot com. No, Pink the Prince, all one word. Um, and it's got, you know, obviously uh, things about all our books on there. Um, and you can, uh, you know, order all our books from there, from, uh, you know, from Amazon. It's got, it's got all the links on there. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, this obviously we're mainly talking about the, um, the, the, the English language editions. Um, but, uh, you know, so. You, yeah, anything can get there, and there, you know, there is a, a, a way of getting in touch with us on there. Um, if, if you do send an email there, they'd be very patient, because you can imagine we get a lot of stuff from all around the world. <laughs> all very in quality, shall we say. <laughs> um, um, but I imagine it'd be the same on your website. Right, but yes, it? if you, you know, anyone wants to have a look on there and find out all about us and all about what we do, um, then that's the place. Great. Again, the website is picnetprings.com, and we're going to uh, take a short break right here and continue then talking more in our member section. And we're going to dive into the, uh, their book, The Stargate Conspiracy, a fascinating subject. But for this seg segment, thank you very much, uh, Lynn and Clive, for being here. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back.